you. Uh, good morning. Welcome to the 15th meeting of 2018 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. We have apologies from Gil Patterson. We may be joined by Joan McAlpine in her role as a substitute member of the committee. Before we move to the first item on the agenda, I want to remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices as these may affect the broadcasting system. The first item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take items five and six in private. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The second item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to uh, consider evidence, draft correspondence and draft reports on its inquiry into the EU environmental and animal welfare principles in private at future meetings. Are we all agreed? Yes. Yes. We are agreed. The third item on the agenda today is to take evidence on our inquiry on EU environmental and animal welfare principles. We're joined by Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham uh, and her officials Ian Jardin, Andrew Vose and Kate Thompson McDermott. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, we'll move straight to questions, unless you particularly want to say anything. Um, Mark Ruskell. Convener, and, and good morning to the panel. Um, can I ask a question to kick things off about the principle of animal sentience? Uh, now, I'm aware that there's the UK bill, the uh, Animal Welfare Sentencing and Recognition of Sentience bill, and that there's been discussions between the UK and Scottish governments about the provision of sentience in that bill and whether and how that will apply uh, to our own laws. So could you give me an update on whether the negotiations and discussions are on that, please? Um, uh, yes. Uh, this isn't an issue that, um, at this point, with the DEFRA DA meetings, it's not an issue that has been um, discussed at uh, a kind of ministerial level. It has been discussed extensively at level of officials um, uh, in uh, respect of uh, what it means. I mean, it's, it's, it's driven by this House of Lords uh, committee. The original discussion, I, I think it's fair to say, really came as a, as a result of um, what the House of Lords were wanting to amend into the UK withdrawal bill. So it's come from a rather roundabout uh, um, way. Um, the, 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 I mean, as, as I think the member probably knows, and as I've said before in the chamber, there is existing, pre-existing Scottish legislation which uh, touches on this, although it doesn't use the, the word sentience because I think sentience is more a modern uh, understanding uh, of this. There is legislation, there is uh, uh, um, existing legislation um, without that explicit um, statement, um, although all Scottish animal welfare legislation continues to be based on the recognition that vertebrate animals can experience suffering. Um, and I think that it's such a fundamental part of animal science, it probably doesn't need much uh, elaboration. In terms of uh, what's happening uh, uh, with regard to the UK as opposed to the Scottish uh, position is um, uh, that uh, we are... Um, I suppose what we're trying to do is make sure we have a clear understanding of the difference between a scientific concept of sentience, which is you know, going to be a very particular uh, thing, um, uh, although we believe that's already recognised in Scots law, and an obligation on governments to actually recognise welfare requirements of those animals. In uh, um, when we're developing policy and legislation. So there's kind of the, the, the slightly different emphasis for this. Um, so we think the actual understanding of sentience is already there. The issue might be the extent to which it is then imported uh, into law explicitly or implicitly. And that, I think, really is where most of this debate has, has landed um, in, in reality. So I, I think from our position is that in principle we do accept um, there should be um, obligations on Scottish ministers to consider animal welfare needs in developing policy um, uh, to that which may apply to UK government ministers in the future, but obviously we're not in control uh, of that aspect of it um, because that does come out of the 
Treaty for the Functioning of the European Union. And this arose more specifically here because of the Continuity Bill and um, the relationship with where we are leaving the EU. So a lot of these, these <coughs> are still questions and discussions that are ongoing, and we're not 100% clear quite what the UK is intending to do at this point. Um, so we've adopted the, the, the kind of principled idea in the continuity bill, and we now need to think about how that is, is taken forward. Mm -hmm. But that's about you know, importing the obligation to have regard to these things rather than the actual issue of sentience itself, which we do mm -hmm. feel is already embedded in Scots law. Okay. So from what I'm hearing then, the intention is to make it more explicit mm -hmm. into law. Uh, that could be done through the Westminster Bill. Is it an intention to also bring elements of that provision into Scots law as well to strengthen what we already well, have? Well, I, I think if, you were, if, if, there was a West, uh, if there was a Westminster Bill and an LCM, in effect, you, you, mm -hmm. you wouldn't be separately doing it uh, in in Scots law, if that was a route that was that was chosen, you wouldn't you wouldn't be doing both. If you see what I mean, that one would uh, uh, supersede the other. But uh, um, you know, we are, as I said, in principle, uh, uh, think there should be uh, the obligation following on from Brexit that currently exists mm -hmm. under the under the EU setup. So there are different ways to do it. it, it, you, know, it, it you know, our continuity legislation would do it. Uh, a future UK bill with an LCM could do it. But if we thought that either of those routes weren't actually achieving it, then we would have to consider whether more specific Scottish legisl uh, legislation is required. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where it is at the moment. Mm -hmm. it, it's mm -hmm. still a, a live, ongoing yeah. discussion. I mean, given that there are a, a range of different animal welfare legislative proposals coming from the Scottish Government. Is it your intention to bring that together into a single bill or to uh, continue to take piecemeal approach to dealing with... No, issues? we've not made a commitment to try and bring it all into a single bill. That would be a fairly hefty undertaking and would not be something that could be done uh, 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 easily um, or indeed within the lifetime of this Parliament, given that we've now got... No, and some of the secondary legislation as well that will be... Yeah. Right. Okay. And to summarise, I mean, I take it that there isn't a difference between the Scottish Government's approach to animal sentience and welfare and the UK Government's. It's just that we've seen quite a different tone in relation to animal exports, live animal exports. So are you, are you, are you adopting the same approach to animal welfare and sentience effectively as a Westminster Government? Well, insofar as we know what the Westminster Government is intending to do, um, we presume so, but at the moment, I don't think we have enough actual detail. I mean, this is a, you know, a, an amendment that came out of a House of Lords discussion, um, and uh, as I indicated, we're not actually having ministerial-level discussions about animal welfare. Um, there are some things happening at a UK level. Um, there are, there's a different programme of animal welfare stuff going on uh, in Scotland. This is about continuing the obligations that we currently have <coughs> under the EU. Um, and uh, if we, uh, I suppose we would want to ensure that that did continue. So we'd have to look at anything the UK government did that, you know, would, would have to fit with that mm -hmm. and then decide whether or not an LCM in those circumstances is appropriate or would we want to find a different legislative vehicle that was a specifically Scottish one. I mean, there are issues. The existence of Scots law and a body of Scots law and case law and all the rest of it does mean that one has to look quite carefully at that. Mm -hmm. OK. Thank you. Let's move on to environmental principles. Uh, Stuart Stevenson. Sorry, can I just ask if Andrew Vos can now leave? Of course, Cameron Secretary. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, uh, convener. I've, I've got a chunky bit of uh, stuff I want to ask, and I'll just ask it all in a one-up to simplify, um, I, which may require somebody to take notes. Um, basically, I'm, I'm looking to uh, establish what role environmental principles will have uh, in the way we both develop policy and uh, construct uh, legislation. Um, so really looking to see 
uh, how environmental principles will be essential to maintaining Scotland's environmental uh, achievements. Uh, and of course, I'm, I'm recognising that the continuity bill makes some reference to this. Um, the, the, the other two things are uh, just simply what advice the Roundtable Environment and Climate Change has provided in this context. Uh, and will there be a report published? And finally, in practice, uh, what difference between the EU-derived domestic legislation which incorporates environmental principle and other bits of our environmental legislation that don't make any uh, explicit reference. So the, the, there's a fair queen there, but I just thought it would be useful because then that allows you, Cabinet Secretary, to answer it in whatever order you choose to do so. <laughs> well, no, very, I, very dangerous. I did see some notes being written. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess not. Very, very dangerous to just give such an open-ended question. Mm. Um, right, OK. Um, I, I, I think uh, I've been making it clear right since the get-go, i.e., you know, after the referendum on Brexit, that, in my view, <coughs> we wanted to continue to adopt... The, the environmental principles and make sure that that was continuing to form the basis of what we were doing in Scotland as, um, uh, as we already had under the EU. So, you know, I, don't in, I didn't then and I don't now envisage any departure from what we're already obliged to do under the EU. And my concern is to ensure um, that that is made safe for Scotland uh, and in whatever way that might be. Um, so I've been saying that, making very explicit commitments along those lines. Um, th there was a slight nuancing of that uh, about a year in when, um, after some conversations, we wanted to make more explicit that that, uh, um, that being um, uh, um, concerned not to depart from those, e those environmental principles as embedded in the EU, um, that, that we, we would also be looking to continue to track what the EU is doing uh, in respect of environmental issues. Um, uh, so in, in terms of specifics, we wanted to continue to do that. In terms of ensuring that there were you know, a set agreed fundamental principles, I've been making very explicit overt commitments now for almost two years. Um, and I guess it's culminated in the discussions around the continuity bill um, and what, what we're seeing in terms of another debate it, with the withdrawal bill and all the rest of it, that, um, that, that we, you know, we should find a way of legislating those principles into Scots law. So I think it is important that we do so because... <coughs> Um, you know, I, I feel that. I mean, there's obviously a discussion to be had about it, and I know there will be stakeholders who will perhaps have some different ideas uh, about the consultation, but the, the way we've been looking at it is legislating uh, for something which we currently have as part of our legislative superstructure by virtue of being in the EU, but perhaps there might be a need to be more explicit about it legislatively but there are of course as this committee will know um, issues when you begin to talk about embedding something in legislation you know there are complicated discussions about definitions about uh, about how 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 robust a definition will will be if you hold it up in terms of actually putting it into legislation so I know that there's a discussion around whether or not there's perhaps other ways to do it um, uh, um, uh, as well. So, you know, I'm, I'm committed to those environmental principles having a fundamental role and continuing to do so in Scotland, um, ensuring that they are um, part of uh, what we do, uh, ensuring that they continue to sit at the heart of our approach, uh, regardless of our relationship with uh, the EU uh, in the future. Um, and, uh, and I guess it's really about the best way of taking that forward. Legislating for it, of course, is not an easy process. I've already referred to some of the challenges there would be around some of it. So there are perhaps discussions there that need to, uh, to be uh, talked about. Um, 
I don't know if that deals with the role uh, part. <laughs> can, I, can I attempt to just play back to you um, a summary of what I've taken from that, which is the, what, what I've heard is if there's a lacuna in the law, mm -hmm. because European law ceases to apply and we haven't yet legislated, the environmental principles that are currently derived from the EU will continue to inform the way government uh, uh, Absolutely. Draw, uh, yeah. bo both acts and at secondary level under existing uh -huh. legislation, etc. Absolutely. Uh, but that beyond that, it is the intention to find an appropriate way to incorporate this into the law that uh, affects Scotland. So that's the two bits I've taken. Yeah, I, 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 th I think that's a reasonable summary. I, um, I don't think that that's misrepresenting anything. And, it, and you know, the issue of the, the timing of it is at the moment we don't really know so sure. there there may you know require to be an earlier sort of iteration i i, I think i'm you know I'm, i may be getting this wrong and sometimes when i read so much stuff i pick up things and they're not it's not exactly on point but i think there is a discussion at the uk level about a kind of national policy framework rather than an actual legislative vehicle so i'm yeah. She's looking a bit, Kate's looking a bit uh, puzzled, <laughs> but I, I, I seem to have kind of read so much stuff, but I have, a, and, and that might have to be an, a kind of interim sort of uh, position. There might be a kind of positioning that we would have to do interim because legislation, as everybody knows, doesn't happen overnight. So legislating for this would be quite a significant undertaking again. And, you know, we would have to know how we were, how we were fixing any interim period as well. Can I, can I take you back then to one thing you haven't made direct reference to, which I, I put in my questions, and that's the role of the round table on the environment, climate change in relation to environmental principles. Has that a role here? Is that helping and will that continue to help, a, presumably in advance of um, any legislation, which well, Clearly, you're, you're, you're indicating to us is certainly not timetabled at this stage. Yeah, it is the role of the round table is, is important. Um, uh, I, th they've given us a reasonable amount of advice in relation to both the principles and to potential govern governance. Um, the draft report, I think, had only just gotten into my hands the day before my last appearance before the committee, or not my last appearance, but the appearance before my last appearance. Um, and they are still um, finalising uh, some of that. Uh, that's an ongoing piece of work. But the round table uh, we expect to continue in being for some considerable time to be able to give us some of this um, useful uh, advice. How, how, Cabinet Secretary, will uh, Parliament see the outcomes of the roundtable Well, we intend to publish. Right, that's, the, the, that's the, 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 the report was, is, it was in draft form, I think, yep. on the 19th of March. Um, uh, they're currently working uh, on that, um, and the, the, the actual final report um, will be published. So people will get to see that, um, and it may be of interest to the committee for a future committee meeting to have a look at uh, some of that. Um, I, I, can, I can elaborate on the advice, the areas of advice that, that Roundtable has, 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 in, has flagged up. Um, they, have, they are in the process of finalising <coughs> advice on monitoring, measuring and reporting of environmental data and on the implementation of environmental law. There going to be providing advice on scrutiny of reports, preparation of independent assessments and reports examining environmental compliance and progress. They're looking at the initiation of investigations, cross-cutting studies and reports. They're looking at mechanisms for individuals or organisations to make complaints regarding the application of environmental law. They're looking at mechanisms to seek solutions to concerns about the implementation of environmental law through interaction with government. And they're looking at powers to refer a public body um, to some kind of uh, uh, court or other group to, uh, for alleged failure of implementation. They're looking at powers to order interim measures to prevent irreversible damage before judgment 
is handed down and powers to require government to take action uh, to bring it into compliance with the power to impose sanctions if action isn't taken. Now, those are all the areas that they're looking at. So the, the kind of final detail advice in all of those areas um, will be part of what is published with the round table. Um, so there is a, there is a, a, a fact-checking process going on at the moment across the whole of government as well uh, as the round table in terms of that draft report. And I need to flag up, uh, I think it's important to say um, uh, that some of what the round table is looking at will um, very much cross over out of this portfolio responsibility and into justice portfolio responsibilities. So it's not simply going to be just for um, one committee or one portfolio. So um, it's, it's quite a complex piece of work. Um, my, my guess is it will be regarded as a starting point rather than a than an end point, um, but we are actually looking very, you know, closely, and we've asked them to look quite closely at that. So that's all the the work that they're doing. That's what they're considering giving advice on. Um, that's what you can expect to see discussed when the final report is actually um, uh, is actually uh, published. But um, th these are not recommendations. These are the areas, the more specific areas that they're actually looking at. It is. Do you have any indication as to when we might expect such a report to be published? Well, the draft is already there. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I don't think it's... Well, it's going to be before month. summer. Yeah, aiming for the end of the month. So, it, you know, it, 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 isn't, it isn't far. We're okay. not, it's not going to be held off until, okay. you know. That, so okay. it'll be, in a sense, um, uh, our, our commitment to consult, which I think... We, we think runs out somewhere around about September, October in terms of time scale with the, with the indications in the continuity bill. Um, the, the round table report will in effect be part of that rather than, than uh, you know, sitting separately and appearing at the last minute. Okay, so. very excellent, thank you. Finally, Klaas. I want to go back to, to some of the responses you gave a little bit earlier. In, in February, Michael Gove committed to putting an environmental principle in a policy statement uh, to ensure that environmental principles continue to be set out in a single place. And after our call for evidence, uh, there was a number of respondents also suggested that it was important that a similar approach was taken uh, across the UK to ensure consistency. Um, does the Scottish Government consider there should be a wide, uh, UK-wide approach? Uh, to environmental principles and law across the UK to ensure consistency? Um, I mean, I think obviously uh, it would be helpful if we were all singing from the same hymn sheet, uh, but environmental policy is devolved, so we will be making our own decisions. I think it's interesting that Michael Gove gave a commitment to a national policy statement, not to legislation. So, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're looking more, you know, at something that might be stronger than that. It's one of the things that we're actually looking at. So um, uh, you could argue that the two years' worth of explicit commitments I've given um, are effectively a national policy statement. Um, we haven't actually framed it in that way, but it could easily be done fairly, in fairly short order. Um, I think from our perspective, you know, we're not just wanting to look at a national policy statement as being the way forward, but perhaps to, ev to be even more explicit um, uh, about, uh, about potentially legislating. So I, I think that was, I kind of, I think I made a sort of fleeting reference to, you know, an interim and a longer term sort of issue. So the, the potentially the national policy statement idea is a kind of shorter term um, while we look at whether or not legislation is actually the, is, is a manageable thing to do in this regard. Um, in terms of it being UK-wide, um, uh, uh, yes, as long as the principles are seen, are the, are the, are, are, are seen as the, 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 the least we can do, uh, the, the, the basic fundamentals of it all, um, I don't want to be held back in any way in Scotland, so we would want to continue to have the freedom to, to make um, uh, stronger environmental statements if we wanted to with the UK government on this issue? There, there, is, a, there, is, a, there is a bit of a, a discussion going on between, uh, initially between my, uh, ourselves and Wales in terms of 
um, uh, agreeing principles. Um, uh, you know, there, there, is a, there is an ongoing uh, conversation with uh, the UK government about what that might look like. So we're not, you know, we're not, we're not, and in fact, we initiated that discussion. So, um, that, but that's not uh, finalised yet, it's ongoing. So, I'd, you know, I don't want to be uh, stuck with that. And as is always the case, it ends up, you know, with discussions about specific phrases and what does, you know, what these things mean. As, as the committee knows, that's often what happens. So you end up in a slightly more protected conversation than perhaps was originally envisaged. Okay. Do you have any further questions, Mr. Carr? No, that was the last one I had. John Scott. Uh, thank you very much. Um, can I just take you back to environmental principles and international law? And what would be the effect of relying on the inclusion of environmental principles in international law post-Brexit? Um, well, the UK um, is currently signed up to um, a, a considerable number of international environmental uh, agreements. Um, I'm not sure what the specific number is, but I know that it's over 40. Um, and they range from climate change, wildlife and habitat protection, um, waste movements, air pollution, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and those uh, international environmental agreements will continue to provide a strong framework for Scotland because they don't fly off um, uh, you know, after Brexit. They continue to provide uh, some of the superstructure that, that uh, we're talking about. Um, I, I am of the view um, that uh, we should continue to do what we currently do in Scotland, which is to both collaborate and demonstrate leadership on the international stage. So we're, you know, we work quite hard at some of that international engagement uh, at the moment. Um, and we want to, uh, very much want the UK to continue to remain party to all of those international environmental agreements, even after Brexit. Um, uh, uh, and one of the, uh, one of the things that we have to do is to look at a potential gap between EU law and international law. And I think uh, effectively that's where um, the environmental principles will have a particularly strong um, uh, uh, impact um, because those environmental principles, I think, are, are not just coming from the EU. They're, they're fairly well internationally understood. They're an international language that, that, you know, that, that countries um, uh, choose to adopt to allow that sense that we're all kind of coming from the same place when we're talking about this. So I think that they continue to be um, uh, extremely important, but we continue to have to look very carefully at this bit of what might be a, a different gap, which is the gap between the EU setup and the international setup. And the international setup, you know, doesn't so, you know, in the marine environment we have international obligations that aren't tied through or solely come from being a member of the EU. Um, they're 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 bigger and uh, uh, broader than that. Um, so, I mean, that's that's our our look at international obligations. But we do already. Um, have a fair amount of engagement directly from Scotland with, you know, these international um, groups and, and thinking about our international obligations. So, you know, we're, we're, we're wanting to be able to continue to do that. Thank you. Um, just reverting back to uh, putting environmental principles onto a statutory uh, footing, and I dare say you've seen the evidence and most of the evidence agreed that environmental principles should be put in a statutory footing in Scots law. The Law Society was slightly more circumspect about this, um, <laughs> suggesting that instead the principles could be included in a Scottish government policy statement. Yeah. Uh, I, I dare say you've seen that evidence and just wonder... I kind of understand that. Um, and, you know, um, I understand where lawyers will be coming from and it's a constant discussion and debate and tension, not just in committees, but in the chamber about, you know, the minute you, you, you move to put something into legislation, you're, you know, the, the, there is a very big discussion and onus on you 
to, to try and ensure that the words you use in legislation um, mean what they say they mean and are understood to mean that when you, when, you know, when you move away from legislation, perhaps when you end up, say, in court or, or whatever. Um, and there's a, there's a, I, I suspect what the Law Society might be concerned about, although they don't necessarily use this language and I don't want to be presuming to speak for them, but it is the difference between legislating an aspiration and legislating an actuality. Um, so legislating an aspiration um, is, 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 is fine in theory, in practice. Legislation is about you know, concrete realities and actual, potentially actionable issues and, and, uh, and, and things like that. Uh, you know, an aspiration doesn't fit as easily into that. And that, again, I don't want to put words into Michael Gove's mouth, but maybe why he's opted for the national policy statement idea rather than legislation. But I don't want to rule out legislation. Um, and clearly, if we were going to go down that road, there would have to be some very careful discussions had um, with, amongst others, the Law Society. Um, but this committee knows very well from experience, once you begin to start to try and define things, how much harder it actually is in practice um, uh, than you imagine it's going to be. Um, uh, so it's, it's, uh, I, I think the Law Society always provides a kind of caveat for us to ensure that we understand that going forward. Um, so so you're, you're, you're not dismissing it at any rate? I would never dismiss not, what the Law Society had no, to say. No, As no, a lawyer, no. I have a fundamental understanding of where they're coming from. <laughs> I'm understood, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Um, so... I think that's really covered. I mean, the, the other questions I have have already been covered and that okay. you intend to be there, but you, there's been a suggestion that um, must have regard to would perhaps be a way forward of, of incorporating or creating new legislation, but must have regard to these principles would also be another way forward. And that's something that... I, I guess, from what you're saying, the whole sure. thing is still It is. Flux. Well, you know, I mean, to a certain extent... You know, there's, I mean, I don't want to prejudge a consultation. No. Um, uh, um, so, you know, there's a there's a there's a there's a, a, a pretty reasonable sized debate to be had about mm -hmm. some of this. Um, um, there's potentially, uh, you know, even if you were choosing to 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 go forward for legislation, that's not going to happen in the very near future. That will take a fair amount of time to. Uh, to bring to Parliament, so you would probably want to do something in any case in in the interim period. So you know, there's a lot to discuss there, um, and you'd need to be very careful that what you did was actually the right thing. Your concerns about enshrining one principle and perhaps not another, and uh, any apprehensions over that. that well, I think we see the four principle. principles as being pretty much... Uh, 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 so I don't think we can start dropping one or two or three of these and, and enshrining one legislatively and picking up the... I don't think that would work. We either... We, we treat them, I think, as a whole rather than as individual. And I don't think... I've not seen anywhere, and I certainly have never viewed them as having some kind of hierarchical status, as if there was, you know, within the four, some kind of ranking. I don't see that. Forgive me, I wasn't meaning that, but I was meaning in, in shining environmental principles as opposed to other principles that come from... Well, Europe. yeah, OK, and that would be part, I think, of a conversation that might be had because there are a great many other principles, and that's back to, you know, the, the utility of legislation for, for, you know, legislating for something that was perhaps seen by many people as more aspirational and uh, you know there are, there's a kind of big area in between um, those two endpoints and these would include subsidiarity and proportionality for example well um, indeed but they wouldn't be for my that that I mean I'm talking about environmental principles if, if I think if there was to be a discussion about trying to legislate or make some kind of formal uh, um, uh, um, reference to other EU principles that weren't environmental principles, then I think you would need to be speaking to other cabinet secretaries about that. Okay. Uh, Donald Cameron. Thank you. Um, Stuart Stevenson touched on this. Um, 
I just was wondering if you had any concerns about um, uh, a difference opening up between EU-derived legislation which incorporates environmental principles and other Scottish environmental legislation in the past that, that is currently in force that doesn't. Is there, is you mean there, that predates? Yes. The, ah, yes. Right, OK. Good. <laughs> well, well asked. Um, uh, that would then speak to, you know, some kind of consolidation in the future, I suppose, which is a huge undertaking. So, you know, we would need to perhaps look at how that might be managed. I, I suppose you could find a way to, to try and, and, and reach out to pull that in. But, but, you know, we are where we are to a certain extent with some of that. Um, and a, a, a piece of, a, a, I guess it kind of goes back to the question <coughs> that Mark Ruskell asked about animal welfare, only in an even bigger context, because that kind of consolidation if anybody's ever been involved in or had to have any, you know, relationship with trying to do a piece of consolidated legislation would not be an easy process. That really would be quite a long-term process. It is an interesting question, though, and I think it's one that we will need to reflect on. Thank you. Before we leave the, the issue of principles, Cabinet Secretary, I, I hear what you say about how complex all of this is, but can I add to the complexity by asking another question? Has any thought been given as to whether uh, a non-regression principle might be required post-Brexit? OK, I saw reference to uh, what were um, talked about. It looked like as if there was a kind of another four principles lurking around that might be added to it. Um, I think in fairness for, uh, for actually it dealing with the situation that we're currently in, our priority has to be to find a way to ensure that post-Brexit um, we've got Scotland committed to the existing four principles. Um, there may be um, a longer discussion, a bigger piece of work to be done that talks about other potential environmental principles, um, but I, I think for the sake of actually achieving what we need to achieve in the timescale we need to achieve it, um, uh, we've not really given detailed consideration to adding other things to it. We're looking at the four environmental principles that everybody understands at present are the ones that prevail. Okay, right, thank you. Uh, Mark Roscoe. Can I turn to uh, how the principles relate to trade and, and trade policy across the UK? I think we've had some interesting evidence on this. We've had some witnesses are suggesting that the incorporation of the principles into Scots law would effectively provide a, a, a backstop to uh, any deregulation around food, food standards or the environment, for example. Um, but we've also had some evidence last week which suggested that the principles on their own are actually too broad and that in the negotiation of any trade deal between, say, US and UK, the interpretation of, say, the precautionary principle may be very different. So I'm just wondering where, where you see these environmental principles sit in any kind of international trade deal, and what discussions there have been, if any, with the UK government on that? Um, well, um, the, the, the issues around um, <coughs> trade um, have been... Uh, part of live discussions for a considerable period of time. So we're not, um, uh, not blind to, the, to the, the, uh, some of what might be raised uh, under that. Um, environmental protections are key aspects of trade policy, but then they will have been so. Uh, every EU trade deal that has been done will have had an active uh, conversation about this. Um, uh, and some of the potential trade deals, it has been an extremely controversial aspect of, of those trade deals. I would be naive to assume that that will not continue to be the case. Um, uh, you know, there is an issue about, I guess, th there is an issue about, right, w where are we just now? We're going to lose the superstructure of EU law that embeds those four principles that we've been discussing. We want to try and find a way to ensure that Scotland continues to have those as part and parcel of what we do. But by doing that, we are not effectively moving beyond what 
already is the situation in the EU. So we're, we're, we're continuing we're, what we're trying to do and what I've explicitly said we will do is continue to, to have, you know, to have those as effectively, I, I think you used the word backstop, but, mm. but would that necessarily mean that there will not be debates? Well, I, I, I couldn't possibly say that that would be the case because there have been debates all the time the EU has negotiated uh, um, trade agreements. Um, we, we did, uh, um, we did in, in the original um, Scotland's Place in Europe um, publication, um, we did uh, set out uh, the, the need for high environmental standards and robust, robust regulations, um, not just for businesses, but for our citizens as well. Um, and that would continue to be um, that would be con continue to be where we would want to be. But I think most members here will be aware that that constitutes some of the discussion that's ongoing about the now list of 153 powers, where there's an argument about competency and where competency lies. So it's a fairly lively political mm -hmm. debate. The extent to which. Scotland's environmental laws mm -hmm. would in the future be able to be stood by in terms of Scotland mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or not. Uh, and that's, do, that's, do a, that's a, a conversation that is happening at a number of different levels, mm -hmm. I think, as the members are probably aware. Mm -hmm. do, do you have uh, particular views then on how a trade deal could be scrutinised in, in relation to environmental principles? Because you seem to be suggesting that there would be some considerable uncertainty and, and perhaps some areas of public alarm as well, well around I, the context of trade <laughs> deals. So I, all I'm doing is pointing out that every trade deal that the EU yeah. has done has had with it partly yeah. a conversation around issues like this. Some have been more controversial than others. Um, um, so. The, the existence of the four principles as being fundamentally part of what you do doesn't somehow magically whisk away any debates around trade deals. And I don't suppose for one single minute that that, you know, wouldn't continue to be the case. So uh, supposing Scotland does what we want to do in terms of the four environmental principles, supposing uh, um, there is no effectively Westminster override, uh, supposing, you know, that that still isn't going to make controversy um, uh, disappear. Uh, and I suppose at the end of the day, um, it depends on who gets the final word on it. Mm. Could a trade deal at UK level prevent uh, the EU principles being placed into Scots law? Could it act as a block? Is that something you foresee or not? I would be astonished if there was any attempt to stop us putting the principles into, into law in whatever way we decide to do it in Scotland, whether it's a national policy statement or, or by actual legislation. <coughs> the arguments around the application of those principles would be what happened in terms of the trade deal. Mm. And I think I'm probably fairly confident in saying that I will be unlikely to be invited to sit around the table at any discussions of negotiation of those trade deals. Well, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you should. I'm trying to be realistic <laughs> about this. <laughs> uh, thank you. John Scott. Yeah, there's a sense of Mark Ruskell's last question. Is there a threat or a risk that the adoption of more stringent environmental principles and regulation into Scots law that this could limit Scotland's ability to to compete on a level playing field. I think the point about the level the playing field in a trade deal. Well, it depends on where you want to put the level playing field. If the level playing field is that we toss all our environmental regulation and principles out the window, then frankly, that's nowhere I want to be. Um, so you know, let's let's you know, we're going to have a discussion about what the level playing field means. Um, uh, you know, that's a kind of bigger question. Uh, and I think that these four principles that we're talking about are pretty 
widely understood internationally, globally, these are not things that we've dreamed up just mm -hmm. you know, in the last year or two. There are things that have already been part and parcel of every negotiation that the EU has ever done. Um, I'm not blind to the fact that it is an irritation to some other um, countries that, that the EU has stuck quite tightly to these. There may be an attempt to um, uh, remove some of their application, but I think that would be um, uh, something that we would want to resist. I mean, I, 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 you know, the, the point about these environmental principles is that they are pretty fundamental, pretty widely understood, part of the international language and understanding of, of how we should proceed. Um, and I would very much hope um, that any trade deal that is struck in the future will continue to have these as part of what they're, uh, what they're discussing. Thank you. And I should declare an interest as a farmer. I don't suppose that I'm not concerned about the principles. It's the, the granular detail of it, things like GM crops um, and how that might work against Scotland's ability to compete in international trade deals, for example, if other countries are using GM crops and we're not. Um, I think that? the last uh, 10 years or so of... Um, Scotland's food and drink, uh, our absolutely huge increase in exports, the um, thriving premium business that we do, selling on a very strong image of Scotland, suggests quite the opposite. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Finlay Carson. You know, I'd like to move on to enforcement. It's obviously important that enforcement mechanisms are introduced to ensure compliance with uh, the principles when and if they're uh, incorporated into Scottish uh, Scots law. Uh, what consideration has the government given to enforcement and dispute resolution uh, mechanisms? Well, I think I've already outlined what the roundtable is giving us advice on, and it's very much um, on point with that. That's, that's in the main the area that they've actually been looking quite hard at, um, uh, whether or not they will... Um, actually try to give us formal recommendations or simply give us a suite of potential uh, um, uh, solutions. I'm, I'm, I can't say, I don't know, Ian Jardin, you're, you're perhaps um, a little bit more intimately involved in yeah. that. Um, but that is very much the area in which they are working. And I just need to flag up what I said earlier. Some of the proposals um, are likely not to be for this portfolio to decide. They may be for um, a, a different portfolio to decide. Yes, yeah, just say so the, the roundtable report essentially sets out options for um, plugging any uh, potential gaps in governance. It doesn't recommend what the right answer is. So I, th I think it is a, uh, it's, um, uh, I think it's important because I, I, we come back to this is about, you know, a consultation that we've committed to on the principles and on governance. Um, that we try not to prejudge uh, uh, the, the outcome of that. So there will be likely to be a range of potential options. I mean, I, 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 I understand some of them, but I am you know, quite clear in my mind that the consultation on governance will have to include justice colleagues as well, which slightly complicates things. It's not just then for us to, um, us to look at. Um, uh, and... That's why there has to be some work being done with other cabinet colleagues on the, on the specific, specifics of this. But I think detailed questions about some of these will have to wait until we've, we've got a final kind of indication from the round table as to what they see as potential options um, and over what time scale, again, some of these might be manageable. So alongside the round table, have you had any discussions with the UK government uh, regarding UK wide enforcement, uh, a, a UK wide enforcement body. Well, environmental policy is devolved. Um, uh, it's devolved to Wales. It's devolved to Scotland. Uh, um, we are, uh, of course, aware and have had some conversations uh, about the um, uh, the UK government's um, uh, own potential consultation. Uh, I know that. Uh, they haven't yet published any consultation on environmental governance, although 
I, I guess it must surely be reasonably imminent, but their proposed consultation document is for England only, not for the rest of the UK, precisely for this reason. Now, there, there, there may be some merit in having some conversations in respect of certain things, uh, um, uh, but uh, it comes back to the basis on which these you know, decisions are taken um, and the understanding that environmental policy is actually devolved. Um, uh, and that there are two other legislatures who are, you know, who have concerns themselves about what might be the way forward, and each quite different. You know, although Wales and Scotland have been having these discussions, the Welsh situation is quite different to ours. Some colleagues have further detailed questions. First, Claudia Beamish, and then uh, Richard Lyle. Thank you, Convener, and, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary, and uh, to the panel. Um, I appreciate the points you've already made, Cabinet Secretary, and the importance of, of highlighting to us that the Justice um, portfolio will be involved in discussions going forward, um, and also the significance of the round table um, in terms of assessment of legal aspects of enforcement and compliance. I wonder if you could give us any sense of discussions which are taking place um, as appropriate uh, with um, the Justice um, Cabinet Secretary, but also uh, more widely on the possibilities of um, enforcement and compliance being done within Scotland. As you've highlighted mm. already, it is, it is a environment <coughs> is a devolved, devolved area. If you mean more widely across government within? I mean, uh, well, uh, <laughs> what, what sort of a body, an independent body, might relate to Scottish? Uh, uh, what, what sort of a body might relate to the Scottish Government, um, such as there is the Commission in Europe or some, some form of body... Well, but in a sense, that's what the round table... That's one of the I'm things. asking you if you could give us any enlightenment well, as, I, to, as I, to... Not what the round table's doing, but to um, Scottish Government thoughts so far, because that will help us in our deliberations. Well, you know, you know the, the, the principal piece of work has been instructed by Government via the round table. So, you know, I'm waiting on that final... Uh, publication. Um, we've said we're consulting on this. I mean, there are, when we see the range of options uh, that the round table indicates to us they think is appropriate, we're, we'll consider whether or not we think some of them are more manageable than others. Uh, um, but uh, um, that's, that's where the, 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 that's where most of the work has gone. Um, I've had discussions with um, others, I've had discussions with some of the ENGOs uh, um, uh, uh, in, in London about this, um, uh, um, and one of um, the difficulties that we have to overcome is that notwithstanding this parliament being nearly 20 years old, they still not entirely understanding the implications of devolved environment policy. So uh, um, the potential for any UK-wide, if, if, if in a sense that's what you're, you're thinking about, the potential for a UK-wide, uh, some kind of UK-wide body. At the moment, there aren't specific things under discussion. Um, and as I indicated, the, the UK-Westminster consultation will be for England only. I, I'm, I'm actually specifically wondering whether as part of the discussions that are going forward as that hasn't been highlighted in relation to the round table whether um, a scottish um, enforcement body uh, is being considered and also well I, the, the round tables report I'm asking to you us will cover being, that well I know, I'm, simply if they're being considered because we don't want to find as a committee that we get a report back and those things haven't been considered so i i, I would ask you please to um well, Bear those things in mind, and also the issue of whether ordinary courts can be made to work effectively in an environmental context, and the view of Scottish Government on the establishment of an environmental court or extension of the remit. But the I'm not court. going to prejudge any of this. There will I'm be not asking a, you to. there I'm will be a range of options. Of there will be a range of options. Um, uh, the roundtable report will be published soon, and well before summer. The committee will be able to look at that um, and uh, uh, in terms of informing um, a potential consultation, the committee will have plenty of time to consider whether or not it can or thinks that there is something else that has been, that has been missed. 
I, I'm trying to make the point, Cabinet Secretary, and, I, and I'm not really making it very well, that surely these issues, if they're not being considered now, it's going to be very late in the day for them. I'm simply asking for them to, for reassurance well, that they're being considered. Their own table was tasked with the job of looking at gaps and coming up with solutions. So right. I think it's fair to say that their consideration ranges across a huge number of different options. Mm -hmm. I would be astonished if anybody managed to come up with yet another one that hasn't been looked at by the round table. Thank you. Okay. Just to be clear, Cabinet Secretary, you, you talked earlier about the consultation and the date of September. Would that be the beginning of the consultation or the end of it? Uh, no, we, we were asked. I think the commitment made was to you know, consult within six months, months of yes. the bill. So we did a sort of rough kind of, and I obviously there's issues, but we did a rough calculation and said that would be the, the absolute end point for launching the consultation. I mean, the consultation itself, you know, would potentially take, you know, I don't know how long yeah. we, we give it. There will be analysis, there will be, and all the rest of it. So, um, uh, off in you know, but to, to get a consultation up and running, uh, you know, you do have to have a bit of space. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Uh, Richard Lyle, then, I want to come in with a question. Yeah, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. I've got, actually got two questions, and I won't lump them together uh, in order to ensure clarity. Um, what is the view of the Scottish Government on the appointment of an environmental ombudsman or commissioner and their role in dispute resolution? Well, I'm sorry, I'm not going to prejudge any of these. The, these you know, that's the kind of thing that will be included in the range of options. Uh, I suspect that the roundtable will come forward with and we'll have to see uh, what they have to say. These are all potential solutions. Um, they may not all be... Uh, potential solutions on their own. There may require to be uh, more than one kind of way to do this. There may require to be uh, interim processes before we can go to full-blown, simply to make sure that there, there isn't an interim gap. There may be, uh, I mean, there, there, are, there are a lot of different ways uh, to, uh, to do this. Um, and, you know, I don't want to prejudge the consultation. Okay, thanks for that. How does the Scottish Government consider third-party interests could be effectively taken into account in the framework and mechanisms for enforcement and dispute Well, that, that will be very much something that would have to be um, dealt with um, throughout the consultation, because that would be um, uh, uh, an in, increasingly, uh, in, 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 in very much part of, uh, of how, that, how that actually worked. Um, so, um, I mean, in a sense, what I've already been saying about uh, uh, the huge range of options that there's likely to be, um, then, then that would need to be one of the things that people looked at, which, which ones gave greater comfort in terms of access than, than others. Um, and all of them will have their access issues. OK, thanks for that clarity. Just to wrap this up, and unless other colleagues have questions, we've been talking here about enforcement, about solutions, but can I just touch on the issue of perhaps an opportunity to increase transparency around some of this? So, for example, there is a suggestion kicking around out there that there should be a duty on Scottish ministers and perhaps extending that to other agencies, including those local authorities, for example, that are not in the control of the Scottish Government, to have a duty to report on the extent to which the environmental uh, principles have been considered in arriving at a decision. Say, for example, the precautionary principle. I just wonder what your sort of thoughts are around that. What, on every decision? Every significant decision, certainly. OK. That, I mean, my immediate reaction to that is it's kind of interesting, but I suppose then it's like the, the statements that go with a bill kind of introduction when you, when you have the various... Mm -hmm you know, indications and memorandum that shows that certain things have been um, have been <coughs> looked at, taken into consideration. Um, I, I, define significant decision, <laughs> which I think is one of the, is where you would get into the issue there. 
Um, well, per perhaps any decision that, that had an impact on the environment. For example, one might, some people might look for a local authority to be required to indicate the extent to which it had deployed the precautionary principle and reached a decision on consenting a, a major fish farm, for mm. example. Just one example. Um, and it's, it, there has been a conversation there in the background about does this whole process present an opportunity to, to, to provide that kind of transparency and that kind of confidence in decisions that have been arrived at? Well, you know, one of the dangers that we're going to get into here is, if, if I may say so, we're, we are where we are because we've got a looming deadline in mm -hmm. terms of Brexit and the need to actually ensure that, that we can manage without major disruption. There's another discussion clearly going on that says, oh, here's an opportunity to come up with a whole load of other things to mm. add to this. Now, you know, I, I guess I, I'm just cautioning that the more we add, the longer this is going to take, the more complicated it's going to be. Um, and uh, I, while I wouldn't necessarily rule out conversations in some of these things, it may slow down the whole process if we have them. Mm. So, so let's just have a think about timescales here. Um, uh, and I think if you were talking about the potential for going to legislation, that's probably a, a discussion that would be very germane to that, um, you know. But we're back to the question of definitions. How do we how do we designate something as, you know, of of significant enough importance to 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 trigger this? So is there a possibility in any way, Cabinet Secretary, that the round table and the consultation process may in the end produce some recommendations for the here and now? Yes. But then recommendations yes. for uh, at some future date? I think we would probably find it quite helpful if people looking at this both within Parliament and externally did think about those timescales, about the, the more immediate challenge that we face and the potential medium and longer term opportunities that might arise uh, out of some of those potential solutions. So I think it's just a case of not seeing what we choose to do in necessarily the shorter term as necessarily the be all and end all, but we do still need to do it. Okay, right. Uh, Alex Rowley. Finally on that, given your last statement, Cabinet Secretary, are you confident that we have the capacity that you have the capacity within government to ensure that you're able to achieve what we have now, the minimum, if you like, <laughs> in the timescales that, that is available. And specifically, do you have the capacity, the resources to be able to make that happen? It's a good question. Um, uh, Brexit has put a huge uh, um, extra um, amount of work uh, onto civil servants that two years ago we could hardly have anticipated. Um, there will be a huge amount of um, work getting subordinate legislation into shape and I think the, there's already been some discussions about how some of that is going to have to be managed um, through committees. So it isn't just about our capacity, it's also about parliamentary capacity um, to manage all of this. Um, it is why I've been careful in most of my conversations to talk about the, the, the shorter term, the, the more immediate challenge that's faced to ensure we're into um, a manageable state and then the potential for longer term fixes. My guess is that we will be dealing with the consequences of Brexit for a, many, many years to come. Okay. I'm looking around the table. I think all the members have covered what they wanted to. Cabinet Secretary, can I thank you and your officials for this morning? That's been quite useful. I'm going to suspend for five minutes and we'll resume with yourself again and a different, different uh, set of supporting officials. Of, uh, officials. Thank you.
Uh, welcome back um, to this meeting of the Environment Committee. The fourth item on our agenda this morning is to take evidence on the advice of, uh, the, of, the, of the Committee on Climate Change. It's been a long warning already. On the Scottish Government's forthcoming Climate Change Bill, the Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform um, wrote to the committee offering to discuss this advice and we're pleased to welcome her today along with a number of officials, namely Dr Sarah Granger and Dr Tom Russian. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, do you want to say a few uh, words to kick things off? Yes, Convener, I wanted to say um, a few words about a very specific aspect um, of the forthcoming um, Climate Change Targets Bill, and that is the advice of the Committee on Climate Change on the design of the target framework. Um, every year when the emission stats are published indicating whether the latest year's target has been met or missed, there's always some debate about whether this has been because of action taken or because of technical changes to the way the emissions inv inventory is, comply is compiled. So it's vital that statutory climate targets allow governments to be held to account for actions taken. It's also vital that we use the best evidence available at any time and that creates a problem. Uh, improvements uh, to the science of emissions measurement leads to changes in our best estimates of Scotland's emissions. It's not just recent years estimates that get updated, the estimates of emission levels right back to 1990, the baseline for our targets are constantly being revised as well. And these data revisions, when large, pose challenges to the transparency with which governments can be held to account. Put bluntly, targets can be either met or missed solely due to the data revisions. When we consulted on the proposals for the new bill in summer last year, we proposed that all targets should be in the form of percentage reductions from the baseline. Under the 2009 Act, some targets are set as percentages and some as fixed amounts of emissions. And one of the reasons for the proposed change is that percentage targets are less liable to be met or missed solely <coughs> as a result of data revisions. However, it has subsequently become apparent that such a simple solution may not be sufficient. If the data revisions are very large or if they are uneven between the baseline and the present day, then even percentage-based targets could be met or missed simply as a result of those revisions. And when I was made aware of this in autumn last year, I felt it was prudent to ask the Committee on Climate Change to update its advice on the target framework aspects of the bill. I wrote to Lord Debin to request his advice in October, and this was received late December, just before Christmas. The CCC has used this opportunity to recommend further steps beyond those it had set out in its initial advice to stabilise Scotland's statutory target framework to future data revisions. They've provided an objective and relatively simple approach to managing the challenges posed by the volatility of emissions estimates, whilst also ensuring that we keep pace with the best available science. Their proposal is to freeze the measurement methods for up to five years at a time and assess whether the targets in those years are hit or missed using those frozen methods. In other words, whether a target is hit or missed will be assessed against the methods that were in place when the target was set. Every five years, there will be a reset of the measurement methods and potentially the targets too, so we never get too far behind the evolving measurement science. We intend to implement the CCC's recommendations in full in the <coughs> bill, and this will allow Parliament and stakeholders to hold governments more, more clearly to account as the goalposts will not move between the time a target is set and the time when it is reported against. It's, it's a fairly complicated issue, um, but I would hope it's an area where we can establish some early consensus. Okay, thank you. Uh, John Scott to kick things off. <laughs> Good morning, uh, Cabinet Secretary again, and thank you. I'm declaring an interest as a farmer, and I'm reminded from what you've just said of what used to be said about the WT nego WTO negotiations, that if you're not confused, you haven't been listening. Um, but <laughs> thank you very much for that um, statement. Taking you back to probably a, a bit, which is essentially about the conclusions you've come to, my questions are probably before you've reached the conclusions that you've come to. And 
Um, the Climate Change Committee um, essentially set out two options to option one to maintain the same level of ambition as in the 2009 Act with subsequent reviews to increase targets by setting the viewpoints which you've talked about and also option two to set a stretch target for a reduction in the CHG emissions by, of 90% by 2050. And they also noted that setting more ambitious targets now to an align to the aims of the Paris Agreement would require actions that are currently at the very limit of feasibility, as well as saying, and it is the limit of the pathways currently defined to reduce Scottish emissions, the committee has not at this time been able to calculate a total cost associated with a scenario that achieves this target. So in the light of those statements, what are the benefits and risks of each of those two options that I um, I, th I think that, uh, uh, first of all, I need to say that we're, we've now embarked on the parliamentary process, so I, I can't pre-announce <laughs> um, the, the final decisions before the introduction of the bill, so I just need to kind of caveat what I'm going to say with that. We were confronted with um, advice, the initial advice from the uh, Committee on Climate Change, which um, effectively, I suppose, arguably, gave us the option of if pretty much continuing on the current track, which is the, the, the longer term 80%, um, or stretching to the 90%. I, at the moment, 80% is, um, I think, where Westminster and Cardiff are at as well. Um, uh, and they did give us the, uh, the, the, the two options. Now, um, uh, uh, the, the decision about what to do in, in, those, in that sense is really about uh, um, one where we have to take into account how ambitious Scotland wants to be. Um, and in a sense, a lot of our decision making in this area is dictated by that. Um, desire to be ambitious. Um, so uh, the the you know the benefits, if you like, of of taking a view that a stretch target is the appropriate one, is that it's consistent with the ambition um, uh, that we set out with um, on this um, climate change trajectory right from uh, from the start. Um, what I can't know is what Westminster will choose to do in terms of its targets or what Cardiff will choose to do in terms of its targets. Now, you know, uh, there is and there was some discussion in the previous session about the benefit of maintaining some form of UK-wide um, uh, scenario. Um, I, I can see that there will be people who will argue that effectively that's what should happen because otherwise there, there are there are issues that arise, uh, um, you know, there's a potential f and we have to be very live to the potential for carbon leakage if, if not very far away there's a more um, arguably relaxed regime. So those are things that we have to take into account when we're making a decision um, about how we will, how we will move forward. So I, I, I have to, you know, we have to make a decision not quite knowing what the rest of the UK is going to do, uh, what the implications of their decisions may be in terms of what we do, but in the, also within the context of our desire to continue to be um, to continue to be uh, ambitious. And you know, I thought the Committee on Climate Change were um, very fair and straightforward in the way they put it. That that from their perspective, 80% was uh, uh, was a reasonable thing to continue with. 90% um, uh, was a, a very stretched ambition um, and you know they weren't saying one or the other and they put it into our laps to make a decision about what we would choose to do and you'll see what we've chosen to do when the bill is published. <laughs> Indeed, and, and, not and notwithstanding that, of course, Anna, that's absolutely within your gift to decide what to do, but um, you've... And of course, we all around this table applaud ambition, but we're also aware um, of, of the risks which you haven't token, uh, spoken about, um, the risk to the economy, um, perhaps um, it, of a more stringent environmental 
regime. Um, do you have any thoughts on, on those risks or not? I think people need to understand the, um, the implications uh, of what it is they call for. Um, I'm not 100% certain everybody necessarily does understand that. Um, uh, I hope um, when the bill is introduced um, to, for, I, I hope and anticipate that there will be um, a very hefty debate about some of the practicalities around it and we will very much want to be crystal clear about what some of the implications are of, of these targets, what they actually mean in, in terms of um, real life as opposed to um, the, the idea of ambition for ambition's sake. Um, I, I, we, we have regard to what some other countries are doing, how they're doing it. Um, so we're looking very carefully at other examples um, when, we, when we make these considerations. Um, and um, I noted, I think, uh, and I can be corrected by officials if I picked it up wrongly, that um, Norway has set a very short-term target um, uh, for itself, um, 2030, but only if other countries around it do the same. <laughs> mm -hmm. So <laughs> I think most countries are kind of in the same space here. We're all hoping, I guess, to try and progress at much the same speed so that nobody is hoovering up because they've decided just to be a little bit more uh, easy going on these things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that is a very significant issue mm -hmm. that has to be dealt with and talked through when we make our decisions about the mm -hmm. headline climate change targets. I suppose it would be dispiriting to think that you make progress at the, the pace of the slowest, which would be something uh, well, indeed. <laughs> I would uh, understand a sense of frustration developing. With but carbon about. leakage is a real problem. Indeed. And I don't mm. think we can simply wish it away um, as a potential complication um, if everybody's in a different place. Okay. So it is a, it is a tricky, uh, it's, a, it's a tricky balance. You spoke of Norway. Do you have any other international examples of going beyond a 90% target? Comparable examples, because there are perhaps countries that who can get there by other means. Well, nobody's doing what we are doing. There, there isn't another country who is effectively doing doing the way we are doing it with annual targets and very you know very stringent rules around it. I suppose the one you're going to hear about most often is Sweden. Mm -hmm. um, Sweden has, has said it will go to net zero by, I think, 2050. But Sweden's measurements don't, for example, include a share of aviation emissions. Sweden's measurements don't include a share of shipping emissions. Sweden's measurements don't, as I understand it, include the land use, land use change uh, emissions. Um, and they um, uh, reserve the right to meet their target by up to by buying up to 15% international credits. So my my estimation of that is that they anticipate to achieve this by a domestic effort, which is considerably lower than our domestic effort, because we are committed to making our targets by domestic effort. So it, it isn't, in my view, um, a realistic comparison. We are not ever going to be in a place, unless there are people <coughs> potentially around this table or in, the, or in the parliament who intend to bring amendments along the Swedish model to amend any climate change bill that we have to do what Sweden does. But I'm going to take a wild guess and say that that wouldn't necessarily be a very popular um, uh, um, set of amendments, which by itself gives the game away. I see. It doesn't exactly sound like a ringing endorsement. Um, <laughs> but notwithstanding, well, I suppose the convener's question still stands. Are there other better examples, or, or perhaps not? Or are we out in front in terms of ambition, which is um, fine? I, 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 
depends on how you define it. I yes. mean, I guess we've, 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 we've just spoken about one country that, you know, will be seen as, as being out in front, but when you actually look at what they're doing, mm -hmm. I'm afraid it doesn't just quite stack up mm -hmm. uh, in quite the same way. New Zealand has made a commitment to net zero, but there's no indication at the moment what New Zealand intend, how they intend to, to, to do that. So I, I, can't, I can't say. Um, I, I, you know, there, there, isn't, there isn't another legislature, you know, who's done anything analogous to what we are doing in terms of how tightly bound we are and I, I how strict our uh, setup is and, and the extent to which we measure things that others simply won't measure. Can I just um, say also, uh, tourism was in the news yesterday for having an 8% carbon footprint, uh, which was news apparently to everybody and, and not um, understood previously to have such a high impact. Um, have you any comments to make on that? I suppose it would be as much of a surprise to you as it appeared to be to everyone else. Uh, um, I, I missed the news emerging yesterday. I heard some discussion on, uh, on a news programme this morning. Um, about the differential environmental impact of tourists. So it's not simply across the board. Um, uh, it probably will surprise nobody that tourists from wealthier countries have a bigger environmental impact because they're more likely to you know, use cars and less likely to use public transport. And so there's, there's probably a lot more work to be done there about what, uh, um, it, what that impact might be. Um, and equally, there may very well be some work to be done about how, on our side as a host country, we might think about um, reducing the necessity, uh, you know, for for tourists to 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 choose or really not have much choice except high environmental impact um, uh, um, sort of decisions that they have to make. Um, but I, I. I you know, other than hearing a discussion this morning on the radio, I'm afraid I'm not copied into all of that. And it's something that undoubtedly climate change officials will probably want to have a look at to see whether or not um, there is something there that we need to be reflecting on. Um, but from what I heard this morning, we just need to be a little cautious that it is, you know, there's a, there's a differential environmental impact depending on the kind of tourism and the countries that people come from. Absolutely. Uh, Alex Rowley, then Mark Roscoe. You mentioned, Cabinet Secretary, about other countries. In looking, trying to look ahead to, to 2050, is cooperation between countries key? Because what we don't know is the, the, the scale of the advancement of technologies. But what we do know is that, that if we have to achieve these types of targets, then we will have to see technology play a greater mm. and greater role, so carbon capture, uh, offshore uh, technologies and, and wind power, etc. And it seems that on our own, you know, for the levels of investment that's needed to achieve what's, what's, what, what's needed to be achieved, that, that we're not going to do that. So to what extent do you look in terms of projecting ahead to 2050 at the advancement of new technology and what extent is, is Scotland working <coughs> with, with the UK government and other governments around the world? in terms of technology in particular? Well, um, I, I think it's fair to say there's probably a, a continuing vigorous conversation about these things. Um, uh, I don't want to kind of rehash the carbon capture kind of issue or the, you know, support for renewables, but, you know, we, you know we've got a situation just within the UK where maybe there's some decision making that that wasn't really thinking about climate change um, when the decisions were made, and they weren't our decisions to, to, to make in these circumstances. I think it's probably important for a lot of the reasons we've discussed already that there's, there's a kind of sense in which countries are moving forward at something like the same pace, um, because, uh, um, it, and I don't, you know, I wouldn't want to characterize that as moving at the, the speed of the slowest, because I think a lot of countries are you know, understand very well the challenge that we all face here and the potential negative impact if we don't do something about climate change. But there's also something that needs to be remembered, and this is very particularly important for us 
um, in terms of how we do what we do and, and you know, we don't anticipate moving away from that, which is this is not just about 2050. There, there, I'm afraid I, I, I kind of get the sense out there there's a little bit of a, well, you know what, it's 2050, that's, you know, 32 years away. But that's not how we do it. We, we do it by setting targets all the way along. So we would have to actually be, be able to answer some of these same questions, you know, for like 2025, 20, 2030, 2040. Um, because it doesn't all just magically happen in 2050. It's actually got to be measured um, and there's got to be a, traje a trajectory that takes you there um, over the intervening period. Now, if we go back to Sweden, they don't set these interim targets, so they've got no actual way of measuring whether they are on that, that trajectory. We choose to do it differently. We choose to be much more um, strict about how we measure that, and we set ourselves targets. And, and you know, so I don't, want, I, I don't want everybody to think that just because we're talking about 2050, we don't also have to talk about how we get to 2050, and that means how we manage the intervening period. And there's an official probably going to tell me I'm wrong about something. <laughs> Sweden don't have annual targets, but they do have some interim oh, right. targets. Okay. Sweden have some interim targets, but they don't have annual targets. So, um, uh, uh, so, so it, 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 it is about, you know, yes, it's about 2050, but the important thing, and I guess this is back to the Committee for Climate Change Evidence, it's being able to actually measure how you get there, how you, how you set out a trajectory to achieve uh, that. And that's where some of the discussions about the very specific things that you need to do uh, and indeed the technologies that will be able to be brought to bear and when we think that might be appropriate for them to be brought to bear. And the Committee for Climate Change has basically you know, said... Um, uh, uh, 80% um, would be reasonable. We would continue doing what we're doing, the trajectory that we're currently on. 90% they think is at the limit of feasibility. And by I think but what they mean by that is really in terms of being able to measure that. Beyond that, they can't see how you, you can, they can't see a pathway. They, they can't see a pathway or a trajectory that will take us with confidence to that. Um, so these are the kind of things that we have to think about when we're actually setting out. But it isn't going to be enough for people um, uh, in and out of this chamber to just say, well, it's 2050, let 2050 take care of itself. Because very soon after the legislation is passed, we would have to be coming up with a climate change plan that showed you how we were going to get there. Thanks, Convener. Um, I mean, it has been put to us that the UK Committee on Climate Change has been quite conservative about the potential for technological change. So I hear what you say, Cabinet Secretary, about the approach of having a clear pathway and annual targets. But if you look back 25 years ago when the internet was becoming a thing, I don't think any of us would have predicted the kind of huge societal change that we had as a result 25 years later. So how do we deal with that aspiration, that technological change within the scope of the targets? He said something interesting, actually, in relation to environmental principles in the previous um, agenda item, where he said that we legislate for actualities, not aspiration. But clearly, there's going to have to be a good, deg good degree of aspiration in terms of where we're going. We can't map out this pathway now. We're probably not going to be able to map out this pathway in the next five years. So how do you, how do you, how do you get the aspiration bit in there? Because there is a feeling that actually we're you know, we're not reflecting the kind of technological changes that, that could take place in the advice. Well, it, it's an interesting um, uh, um, phrase that you used about, you know, we're not going to be able to map out, you know, for the next five years. To 2050, willing, no. Yeah, but I'm, I'm, I'm willing to bet the first climate change plan post this legislation, that's precisely what you're going to be asking. Um, uh, and, and that's the basis on which the climate change plan will be assessed as to how accurately it is actually working towards that. And I think the point I'm making is that we can only kind of do that if, if we have some understanding of a trajectory going forward. Now, you know, we, we, we've looked very closely um, at, at, at how to arguably square the circle, which in a sense is what you're, what you're kind of looking for. Mm -hmm. Um, and people can make a decision about the bill when the bill is introduced. 
Um, but these things are not going to be um, simple and straightforward, and neither can the first climate change plan effectively do the, the written down equivalent of shrugging shoulders and saying, oh, well, it'll all be all right on the night, because we can't know that. And, you know, yes, there have been astonishing technological changes in the last 25 years, but they weren't necessarily where we thought they were going to be. So, you know, mm -hmm. that's, you know, one of the, one of the challenges. We, we, you know, um, you, you, you just, you, you don't know where things are going to come from. You don't know what the impacts will be. Um, uh, and trying to then work out how you're going to proceed on that basis is challenging. I mean, it's challenging at 80, never mind, you know, uh, beyond 80. Um, but these things don't go away. They'll become exacerbated if we, if we try to set ourselves um, uh, targets where we can't show any, any reasonably um, objectively assessed trajectory. And I think that's the issue that I'm concerned about. Thank you, uh, convener. Um, could I just explore that a little bit further, Cabinet Secretary, just briefly? Because my understanding is that uh, with the, uh, the bill in um, 2009, that, um, that that was without, a, certainly, of course, a pathway to 2050. But um, in my view and that of a number of others, um, even there was some vagueness about 42% um, by 2020 at that point. And, there wasn't a clear trajectory for that, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what I've, I've understood. So surely if we're going to um, be as, as aspirational, but also realistic as we can be, if they're interim targets, surely we should be even bolder possibly for um, Right, I have no problem with that if that's where people want to go, but they have to be honest as to what it means in practice. And I think that's, mm -hmm. that's a conversation that will mm -hmm. need to be had throughout the course mm -hmm. of this bill. It can't just be had in terms of, you know, well, that, that's a good thing to do. And I, don't, you know, and I don't mean honest in terms of the timescales. I mean mm. honest in terms of what it actually will mean mm -hmm. and when it will mean it. Um, and, and I'm not sure that's a conversation that's being had at the moment but it is one that needs to be had so that people understand when they're, you know, when they're passing legislation or calling for legislation, that they understand that in five years' time or ten years' time, there's, there's no purpose in being outraged at something then happening, which was pretty obviously going to happen because of what you've made a decision about previously. So I think, I think this discussion will have to be had in quite blunt terms so that everybody understands precisely what it means. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm going to bring in John Scott, but if I can uh, remind people to make sure that their mobile phones, etc., are turned off. John Scott. Thank you, uh, convener. And can I just say how much I welcome uh, the Cabinet Secretary's um, ambition, but also her... her caution about pragmatism too and how the two must go hand in hand today I think that's absolutely vital of course we applaud ambition but we have to be pragmatic about the realities too and therefore in that regard if Scotland adopts a more ambitious target which sectors would be required to further reduce their emissions well in your view I mean you know you, you arguably all sectors will require to to, to, to do that. The, you know, there's been considerable discussion about some of the unevenness about um, uh, different sectors. You know, we've clearly made enormous strides in the energy sector, um, uh, um, not quite so spectacular in some of the other sectors. And most people um, flag up things like transport and agriculture um, uh, as, as well. Um, significantly increased ambition will mean significantly increased expectations across all sectors, um, including uh, um, those that have, have felt not to be perhaps achieving as much as they, they should have been achieving up until now. Um, and, and those are some of the, the, the quite blunt discussions that need to be had. Um, uh, uh, so, um, you know, the, there's, there's, there's going to be an interesting conversation with a variety of different stakeholders about what they understand mm -hmm. their calls to mean. 
So, for example, the livestock sector and agriculture would be facing very significant changes the more ambitious the targets become. I, I, I think the more ambitious the targets are, the, the more challenging it will be to persuade people um, about dietary change and the impact of dietary change on the current livestock sector is pretty well um, uh, directly connected um, and potentially therefore very, very significant. But I don't think people necessarily draw lines between these dots and that's where I think folk have to be a little bit more um, uh, uh, honest um, about these things. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, what influence does the Scottish Government have over policies and actions in these areas? Um, or how do you intend to use the influence that you in, have? In what? In climate change or in... in sorry, I'm, I'm, which, which About areas? The, the targets, essentially. Um, essentially, I suppose you've answered the question by saying you're going to have the, the discussions with both stakeholders and those in charge of delivering the targets. Yes, I mean, I, I, I you know, this, this, this can't just be down to government. Um, um, government can set the parameters, it can legislate in certain areas, it can... It can, uh, it can um, use a variety of different governmental mechanisms, um, but it isn't just about government. Um, it, it is about uh, um, all public organisations, whether they be um, uh, um, in the private sector or, I mean, by public organisations. I mean, there's a lot of stakeholder groups who are in the public space um, uh, and discussing this. Um, so the conversations will have, to be, will have to be had with them because if you're an organisation that is going to call for X, it is incumbent on you to ensure that your membership understand what X means and are, are actually part and parcel of where you've mm -hmm. said you want to be. And, and so, you know, we, you know we, can, we can only go so far. Uh, um, this is a democracy, so we are still, you know, we are still have to operate within that setup. Um, uh, so we can only go things so far as a government. We cannot do it all on our own. Um, and that's why we need to have this wider conversation and it needs to be an honest conversation. Would you accept that one of the roles of government in that regard may be to illustrate to industries, you, you've spoken of the transport and agriculture sector, as to the, the route map, as it were, how to get there, what the knowledge dissemination on, on what best practice will well, be? Well, that's a two-way process because some of what we know and understand will in turn have come from what they're informing us about. So there isn't a, you know, it, it isn't a, I mean, a dialogue you know, requires more than one partner in it. So it will be a constant dialogue. But then I go back to some of the things that we just have to be a little bit cautious about is what the negative impacts might be um, in some areas, in some sectors, if there's a, if there's a, if there's a feeling that actually um, uh, this is all going too far. And what we don't want to see is people drifting out of Scotland as a result of that. A very good point. Well made. Thank you very much. Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, climate, just, climate change is already having catastrophic effects on the lives and environments of those who did least to cause it. And to tackle climate change in a just way, um, many stakeholders and others argue there's a need to recognise the fair share of responsibility in a global and historic context. And this was put in stark um, reality for me when I chaired a UN House Climate Justice Conference um, the week before last. Um, that I'm, I'm wondering, although today we, of course, may not feel directly responsible in Scotland for this historic inequality, we um, should perhaps acknowledge um, that it's in the past. It's a past that we still reap the benefits of. So just to highlight one um, stakeholder view, Friends of the Earth, Scotland has extrapolated the fair share carbon budget data to find that Scotland should reach um, net zero emissions between, um, well, by 2040, um, and Stop Climate Course has highlighted uh, 2050 as, as their proposal. And I'm wondering whether you could comment on the consideration of stakeholder engagement and what, um, what 
conclusions you've drawn from, well, from those? I can make a number of comments. First of all, um, I think at every uh, opportunity where it's been appropriate, I've made the point that uh, Scotland was um, one of the cradles of the Industrial Revolution. So we are, and uh, the phrase I have used is that our sticky fingers are all over climate change because right from the get-go, we were beneficiaries of it, although uh, arguably the vast majority of the population didn't benefit massively. Um, from the Industrial Revolution. Um, some small, fairly wealthy people benefited fairly massively. Um, we have been very conscious of the climate justice side of things. Um, we were, I think, the first country in the world to, to, to actually uh, uh, identify climate justice as a, as, a, as a specific funding stream and a specific issue um, that, uh, um, that we should be pushing. We have done so. Um, at every level, we were, I think, one of the first sub-state uh, contributors to the UN Climate Justice Fund, um, that, and I know that the UN was very, very grateful for that because they were able to use Scotland as an example, um, precisely for the reasons which uh, you've, you've laid out. Um, uh, as you're well aware, we've also got a commitment to setting up a Just Transition Commission, so we are conscious of uh, some of the inequalities and issues around that that can uh, that can emerge from any um, big change that might take place uh, as we move to a low carbon, uh, low carbon economy. And yes, I'm very well aware of the various um, uh, um, calls put forward by different uh, organisations, but uh, um, I think it's incumbent on all organisations when they make these calls uh, to be explicit about what they think will be required in order to get there. Um, and sometimes that's the bit that's missing. Um, the the, the high-level call is there. Um, the actual practical likelihood of what we would have to do to achieve that isn't there. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very much up for us having that as a very upfront debate. Because, uh, you know, if the decision is that that's what people want to do, they need to understand the implications of it. Thank you. On that point, Cabinet Secretary, recognising the observations you've made. However, I think it was WWF last year produced a, quite a well thought through uh, document that looked at what the bill could do in a very practical sense, not necessarily the high level targets, but some other things in there. And, and they argued through what would need to be done to achieve that. Uh, um, you may well have had sight of that document. I'm just wondering if there will be things like that I, I would need to go back and have a look at that to yeah. see whether or not uh, um, uh, that was that was something that um, uh, would be helpful in in this current con uh, conversation. Um, a lot of uh, what I see tends to be at the level of well, work, you know, we shouldn't have free workplace parking and things yeah. like that, um, which, which is you know a, a, you know a really good level of the debate, but doesn't even begin to scratch the surface when we're talking about some of the ambition mm -hmm. um, that we're discussing now over the period between now and 2050. Yeah. Or indeed, in some cases, the call is for 2040. OK. Mark Roscoe. I hear what you say, Cabinet Secretary, about being explicit about actions that, that need to be taken where we can predict it. But are, are we being explicit about the impacts as well um, of different targets? Um, thinking here about the UK Climate Change Committee, they're using an overshoot model which effectively means that temperatures can increase beyond one and a half degrees centigrade with the expectation, the hopeful expectation, that they'll then slip back again to one and a half degrees. Now, there's an impact there, isn't there, in terms of extinctions, deaths as well in this country and around the world. So I'm just wondering, when you're actually looking at different scenarios and different targets, what, what target are you actually pegging that to in terms of temperature? increase and is there an analysis of what the impact of that is in terms of disruption to the well, economy, are, deaths, extinctions, all of that? We are constantly having to look at both sides of that because the, you know, the, the people will often ask what is the cost of what you're doing in terms of climate change but of course there's a cost to not doing it um, and you know the cost of not doing it, um, uh, it, it isn't always easy to assess but it is you know can be expressed not just in in, in a monetary sense, but also in, uh, in the cost of the kinds of things that um, biodiversity loss um, and, and the kinds of things that, uh, that, that we're already, already talking about. And, and yes, I do think that is absolutely part of, uh, um, part of what the discussion um, should encompass. 
Do you think, do you think overshooting then beyond one and a half well, degrees is Well, do you know what? I'm not a climate scientist. Um, I, I, I rely on the Cl Committee for Climate Change to give the best advice uh, that they can give us as to how to, for us to move forward. I think, uh, you know, if there was to be a detailed discussion about what the climate science is behind that, I would be moving slightly out of my comfort zone. Okay, uh, Sarah, I don't know whether or not you want to say um, anything additional on that. So the, um, the Committee on Climate Change... Is yeah, the, sorry, the advice from the Committee on Climate Change is in line with the Paris Agreement, and these are discussions that primarily happen at that level. Um, the detailed climate science um, behind the agreement of the Paris Agreement isn't something that we've got into detail in within the Scottish Government, um, which really just um, a bit more detail backing up your point, Cabinet Secretary. Is that something you'd be looking to get, given that the IPCC re reports come out again in, in October? Because well, clearly there will be an impact of are, increasing global temperatures and then struggling to bring them we back are, down. We are, like everybody else, waiting with interest to see what the IPCC does say. And I expect you know, that will inform some of the discussions um, uh, uh, around the bill. Um, but I think from what mm -hmm. Sarah is basically saying, the CCC are already plugged into um, some of that conversation. Um, uh, and and are are effectively feeding back via their advice, um, their their um, assessment uh, of of what we can and cannot do now. Okay. And I know we're coming on to more sort of technical parts of this, but I think I would I would welcome the the statement that you made that we have to have a very upfront, open and transparent mm -hmm. discussion around the implications of offsetting targets uh, moving forward. And is it not the case that you therefore also, to what extent climate change will drive government policy? I saw at the weekend, for example, that I think it was the GMB trade union was saying that, that really we haven't had uh, a great advantage and, and, and Scotland in terms of jobs from renewables. And, and they would argue that, that things like fracking will bring jobs. And that balance and having that, that discussion. Um, I, I so, so I think as part of that, and, and would you encourage that discussion and, and, and look at how government can make sure that in moving towards those targets, we actually, there is real jobs and how those jobs come about and how the economy succeeds. Well, to, to, to an extent, that's what the Just Transition Commission is, 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 is expected to be able to do. And I would very much you know, welcome um, that level of engagement um, uh, across the board. So it um, be interesting. I haven't seen the specific kind of um, statements from the GMB. I'll no doubt kind of get them from officials. But, uh, um, but then you know, what you talked about there was in itself in extremely controversial. So, all of this um, uh, kicks off um, a, a huge uh, debate. Um, uh, and yes, the, the, there are issues around, um, and the point about the Just Transition Commission is to try and get us into, uh, into a place where we, where we can navigate through the transition to a low carbon economy without leaving people behind. Um, uh, some of us around this table are old enough to remember when there were job titles that are now history because technology changed so rapidly that certain jobs just disappeared off the face of the earth. And if you talk to somebody now about some of those job titles, they'll look blankly at you. Um, that is a tricky thing to manage because you can't know exactly what that will be. Um, but if I go back to the bit of the conversation, which was about talking, in fact, I think it was you talking about the, the discussions with other countries about technology and all the rest of it, that's really important because that will help give us a better understanding um, uh, of where we can maximise the potential benefits out of some of this because there potentially are benefits and that's the bit that we need to kind of think there are, there are some opportunities here and benefits as well um, but all of that is harnessed in a way which um, uh, which does mean that it does end up with jobs and perhaps better working environments. Um, and some job titles may disappear, some actual jobs may disappear, but they become replaced by, by other jobs, and that's really how we go. I, I sometimes reflect on 
what it might have been like had there been a just transition commission around about 1805, what that might have looked like in terms of getting us into the and out of the Industrial Revolution. But that's a parallel timeline <laughs> in which it didn't happen. <laughs> Moving on from that point, uh, Stuart Stevenson. Convener, I want to uh, start to explore more the interaction between government and the Climate Change Committee and perhaps uh, take us back to the 2009 Act, which I took through Parliament, um, which uh, we, we were sitting there with Climate Change Committee recommendations for 2020 of 34% or 42%. Uh, and we ended up amending at stage three to make it 42%, putting the 42% on the face of the bill. There was nothing vague about that target uh, whatsoever. Uh, but, but the principle adopted then, and I want to ask if this is one which you're minded to continue with, is that we should not have politicians deciding the numbers. We should rely on the Climate Change Committee, who are looking at the totality of scientific advice that's available, and explaining the conclusions and recommendations they come to. And therefore, that rather than politicians make decisions, we should primarily, primarily uh, be looking at the Climate Change uh, Committee's recommendations, particularly uh, in relation to uh, interim targets. Well, I, I can't bind Parliament. I can't bind other members of Parliament. I don't think there's a rule around that. But the Committee for Climate Change is our best advice that, that is the, the source of our best advice that channels the international understanding into the... And, and don't forget, that's the, <coughs> that's the committee that advises um, all of the governments within the UK. Um, and I, it's interesting, I wasn't involved in that particular um, uh, piece of legislation, um, but uh, um, it's interesting that they presented us with two, two options then, and they've done the same thing again. So it's clearly a... Uh, a way the Committee for Climate Change work, which is they they offer an option that that is 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 doable and and will achieve uh, an end, but they'll also offer a stretched option um, for for an alternative discussion. Okay. And in a sense, that's what they've done this time. They've offered two options. Um, what's been interesting is that nobody has much been interested in one of the options that they offered. Um, and the debate has taken place between uh, one of their options effectively and an option which they gave us advice about was not at this point, um, uh, in their view, something that they could see a pathway to. Um, yes, and of course the Climate Change Committee uh, requires unanimity of all the jurisdictions in these islands uh, on all appointments to it. So therefore, properly reflects uh, the, the interests of all. But that's just an observation. Um, the, the, are we on track for uh, the 2020 target? Yes. Uh, right. OK, that's fine. Uh, um, now, just to return to the subject of percentages uh, as distinct uh, for, for targets, percentage reductions, and the complicated issue of uh, baselining, um, is it is it something that uh, the government is thinking about in terms of making sure we can see percentages against the baseline that relates to when the target was set, uh, rather yes. than yes. a revised target where we would then reset the clock? Yes. 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 It's, that's, that's it. We, we, we think that's a more straightforward uh, way, more transparent way of presenting it. Um, um, uh, I, I don't recall, I mean, I, I, you may be in a better position to recall some of the discussions that would have been about the fact that we have a mixed system at the moment. Um, uh, so, uh, so we want to move to this more um, simple, straightforward uh, um, uh, sort of thing, which is adopting the CCC's recommendation. Um, so all targets set as percentage reductions from baseline levels. Um, and we're still looking at two baselines, 1990 and 1995, for different, for different, uh, gases. different gases. Yes, for different gases, yeah. Right. Okay, I think I've covered my bit. Well, thank you, Stuart Stevenson. Uh, Donald Cameron. Uh, thank you, convener. And I think um, the Cabinet Secretary's statements at the start have slightly preempted these questions. But <laughs> <Sorry>. um, <laughs> um, 
that there's reference, I think, in, in the Climate Change Committee's recommendations to the greenhouse gas account. Is that the same as the, the five-year freeze that, that you, yes, it's, that you, it's, you it's, referred to? Yeah, it, it, it is the same thing. It wasn't, it wasn't a phrase that mm -hmm. officials were using. It seems mm -hmm. to have been in a, phase, a phrase that the Committee for Climate Change used, but that's essentially what it is, yeah. And um, I was going to ask, uh, obviously that advice was directed to you as the Scottish Government. Do you have any indication as to whether uh, that will be adopted across the UK or, or is, it, is it Scotland specific? Oh, I, I can't answer that. I'm presuming if they're advising us along those mm -hmm. lines, they must be giving similar advice elsewhere, but it's not for me to... I, I, I don't know. I, um, I, and I don't know quite where Westminster and Cardiff <laughs> are in the process either. Um, so the, they're... They're, I'm not quite sure. I don't know, um, Sarah, if you know where they are in their processes. Um, so um, in Cardiff, Tom, I think, is quite keen to speak. Right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so the Welsh Government are kind of in the process of setting their interim and five-year carbon budgets, having just passed their primary legislation. Uh, the UK Government obviously has its primary legislation and its carbon budgets out to 2032. Um, I think... One very relevant factor here is that of those jurisdictions, Scotland is unique in having annual targets, and a substantial part of the reason why the CCC of, uh, or why we, why we understand the CCC have to recommended this um, freeze approach relates to the fact that annual targets means you're more exposed to volatility in the measurement kind of science that underpins underpins it all. Whereas both the UK and Wales have five-year budgets as their Kind of on the way targets and within those budgets there's inevitably a bit of averaging out of the volatility so the same issues apply but scotland's probably more exposed to those issues than either the uk or wales thank you um whenever measurements are changed um the charge can be made that the goalposts are being shifted mm. i'm not saying I, I share that not least because the the ccc has recommended it but can you reassure this committee that we will not see as a result of this uh, new new modelling or, or new system, any diminution um, in our efforts? I think one of the problems is that actually the goalposts <coughs> have been changing constantly because we've not, we've not <coughs> thought about this or not had, had, had a long look at this before. Um, uh, and there's been years um, when we missed targets because of science, because of data revisions, not because of anything we had done or not done. So, um, so in a sense, the goalposts have constantly been changing anyway. Um, and what we're trying to do is to put this now on an even keel. We have spoken quite widely with groups. Um, you know, I, I, I think, you know, we're not, we're not just clutching a, a solution and just applying it without there being some considerable discussion. And as members can understand, it's quite technical. Um, and it takes some explaining. But I think those people who understand what's going on here um, are unlikely to regard it as some get-out-of-jail-free card. Um, um, it's not, because, the, because the, 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 the reality of the, the data changes will always be acknowledged, that we will always have um, the, the, the reality of what the science has done, even on that kind of annual basis. It's just that when it comes to the greenhouse gas uh, uh, stats, um, we've got a way now of managing it slightly better. I mean, uh, you know, some of the principal issues are around the, the Lulu CF sector, the land use, land use change forestry sector, um, and notably that's a sector which, as far as I can see, most countries just don't count at all. Um, uh, um, so you could argue that we've put goalposts in that other countries haven't, have just dodged because of the difficulties that they could see it was going to cause. And we are now confronting some of those difficulties. Um, briefly, Stuart Stevenson, followed by John Scott. Um, I just wanted, uh, in relation to advice from Climate Change Committee being different to different jurisdictions, um, is that in part because, of course, the Climate Change Committee is responsible for what it says in terms of advice, but that advice is often against questions that jurisdictions will have set to the Climate Change Committee, and therefore the advice will relate, in yeah. part at least, to the different questions different jurisdictions will well, well, indeed, and the updated advice that we got from Climate Change, so we had early advice last year, and then we went back with updated 
an updated request because of the Lulu CF issue. Um, um, so they were responding in, in detail to a very specific question that we were asking. The reason we were asking it is because any changes to Lulu CF signs um, obviously have significantly, by a very large margin, significantly greater implications for Scotland because of you know forest cover, peatland, etc than they do for the rest of the UK. So the rest of the UK, the jurisdictions might not feel that they need to really look very closely at this. <coughs> we were under no doubt that we had to, and, and that's why we asked for the updated advice from the Climate Change Committee. So they were responding to very specific requests from us about a very specific issue, um, which uh, uh, we could see was gonna create a real problem. Thank you. And uh, John Scott. Uh, thank you, convener. And uh, Cabinet Secretary, where targets are constantly, well, not changing, but the science on which they're based is changing and improving, um, can you undertake around the edges of the bill, as it were, to provide the sort of maximum transparency um, about the, the changes in the science that lead to these changing positions oh, because about the actual science changes right indeed okay. in, <laughs> indeed and, and because as donald cameron suggested yeah. um you know moving goalposts and, and transparency i mean i'm not suggesting for a moment that government would oh, move goalposts to suit their own ends but the greater the transparency the the, 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 the the less the opportunity would arise for that accusation to be made. No, I, I think that's fair enough. And I think, yeah, I think there are, um, I, I think we can probably maybe write to the committee just with a, perhaps an explanation. Don't look so horrified. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I can, I, can, I, can, I can run through in broad terms what the, what the four main reasons for revision change for, for the revisions are, and you, you, that begins to set out what some of the some of the issues are. I mean, first of all, there are changes to international scientific guidelines. Now we've got no that's just that happens elsewhere. Maybe takes you know a while to filter through, um, but that's really basically um, uh, uh, that we're using methods to complete to compile the UK inventory that are consistent with international guidance from the UN, and that guidance is periodically reviewed and updated. So that's a, that's a big international level. So you can get changes at that level. Um, you can get improvements to UK level methodologies. Um, so the UK inventory um, regularly gets peer reviewed by the UN, who then make recommendations for improvement. And again, continuous improvement happens at that level. Then there are revisions to UK wide data sources um, uh, sometimes um, that's uh, revisions to statistical publications, for example, fuel consumption stats might change, and that can lead to revisions in the UK inventory. That, that tends to be a minor thing, but it can happen. Uh, and finally, improvements to the methods used to disaggregate the UK inventory. So sometimes there's improvements in Scotland-specific data, which can allow for improvements in how the UK inventory is disaggregated. Again, they tend to be minor. So most of the changes are really at the, at the international scientific level um, and you know, then filter through to us. So it's not Scottish scientists, uh, or it might be Scottish scientists are involved in it, but it's, it's internationally understood um, scientific measurement of for example, carbon emissions from degraded peat. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, so, so that changes in people's understanding and they get better at measuring that um, and the science gets better and then that has to come through to our, our, uh, our, our kind of science. What we can do is perhaps, you know, outline some of the things that have happened over the last couple of years. Um, last year, I think we benefited from, did I get this the right way around? We benefited from some changes in forestry science that were down to a better, a, a, an ability to actually capture a wider range of for, forestry, smaller forestry units and add them into the total, the total amount. So they were measuring, there was a better measurement there, which gave us a bit of an advantage, but there was some things on the waste side that actually were, 
were a negative impact. So, the, the, you know, the, the, we can give some examples of some of those science changes. Um, uh, we, we, we don't necessarily have control over most of it. I appreciate that. You know, <coughs> UK government decisions. I suppose, I suppose what So it's, a, it's really, a, you know, we have to deal with the hand we're dealt, effectively. It, indeed, and improve on it as best you can. Um, but I suppose what I'm saying is the greater the transparency, the more, as it were, the government shows um, parliament, politicians, they're working, the more likely there is for um, a collegiate approach between all parties to, to achieve the, the transparency if, if the workings are being shown and, um, and peer-reviewed internationally. Yeah, I, I think the statistics that are published will still cover all of it. So, you know, when the science changes and the, the stats change, they'll change because the science changed and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. This is very particularly how it's reflected in the greenhouse gas emissions stats as against how we set our targets. So it's really about a, a mechanism for actually making sure um, that we don't run into a risk, and we haven't really spoken about it, but... If people feel that the goalposts have been moved, because not because of anything that we've done, but because a group of scientists have completely changed the way they measure something, then you run the risk of people saying, well, what's the point then? What's the point of all the work that we try to do? Mm -hmm. So that has, there's two sides to that discussion about, about, the, uh, about the need for people to, to, to kind of understand. So we don't want people walking away thinking, well, pff, if nobody knows, if you can't tell from one year to the next, what's the point? We don't want that to be a response, which is what this is an, effectively um, a, a, way, a way to deal with. But what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll set out in a bit more detail those four potential ways that the data can change, the revisions come about, um, and give some examples of some of what's happened in the past, including flagging up the years where we missed targets, annual targets, because of science changes. So, you know, sometimes we gain and sometimes we lose. Sometimes it might net off, you know, neutrally because you've, you've you had a benefit from one sector and then a, a negative impact from another sector. So we'll, we'll lay out some of the examples. Um, I guess what I want to be absolutely clear about, though, is the reason that we've responded. We've lived with it up until now. I mean, everybody's kind of knows that, you know, there, there are things that affect from year to year. Of course there are. We've lived with it up till now, but we know that the current incoming science uh, revision is going to have an incredibly big impact on all of those countries that are where land use um, and land use change is is a significant part and is and is and is measured, which mm -hmm. might only be Scotland. <laughs> okay. uh, Richard Lyon. Thank you, uh, convener. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, on the subject of revision, the Committee on Climate Change recommended the overall accounting framework should shift to one based on actual emissions rather than adjusting for activity in the EU emissions trading scheme. Um, they stated that a shift to using actual emissions would be more transparent than the existing framework and would encourage decarbonisation in all sectors of the economy. Um, what is your view on the actual accounting rather than net accounting? And do you accept the Cl Committee on Climate Change recommendations in relation to moving to actual accounting rather than net accounting? Um, yes, we do intend to measure progress to targets based on actual emissions um, by removing the current accounting adjustment um, to reflect the operation of the EU ETS. Um, uh, apart from anything else, we've, we've got no indication in any case of what's going to happen with the EU ETS, um, if anything. Um, that will improve transparency. Um, the 2009 Act adjustment was quite complicated, so I think this is a much more straightforward way of managing it. Most people won't know what the ETS is, much less what the calculation for adjustment uh, means. Um, but it doesn't actually... Um, that I don't want that to imply any change to the operation of international emissions trading schemes uh, in Scotland. Um, it's just about an accounting mechanism. It's not about our view towards international trading schemes, because I think we are going to need something 
to replace the ETS. I don't know quite what it's going to look like. I mean, ideally, I would argue we could try and stay in it. Um, but if we're not going to stay in it, we need to have something that, that works across boundaries. Okay, That's an example that. of a framework I've been asking for for about two years and getting nowhere with. <laughs> thanks for that. What are, what are the relative risks and merits on, the, on this move? And is it likely that overall targets will become easier or harder to achieve? Uh, I don't think it really changes the achievement. It just makes more transparent what we're actually doing. It's not really about um, actually it, it, it doesn't. It's not. It's not the hard easy. Isn't about uh, the achievement of the of the targets. It's about the actual transparency of what we're doing. But it's back, I guess, to the um, uh, um, you know basing it on Scotland's actual emissions. Um, uh, uh, so, uh, which I think is for any country is a more accurate reflection of what is happening, what they're doing. Okay. Thank you. The, the, we talk a lot about counting the emissions in a variety of sectors without very often getting into how those are counted and how accurate uh, the counting is. I'm just wondering, in re relation to, particularly to industrial emissions, what the methodology is. Is it internationally recognised as best practice? How accurate is it in, in broad terms um, compared perhaps to other calculation methodologies that we use? Um, and how often is it re uh, reviewed, updated and improved upon? Well, I think we've talked quite at length about how, how science and revisions come about, and that applies virtually across the board. That will, that will apply uh, in all sectors. So for the last part of your question, in a sense, that's the answer. It's, it's a constant process. The actual specific way it's... Um, uh, calculated. I'm going to be looking at uh, Tom. I Russell suspected you might. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> to, to perhaps be able to answer that more in, in a more um, coherent way than I would. Um, so I'll, I'll start off by saying that we're very happy to provide a kind of more a detailed, written explanation of how the uh, emissions from all the different sectors are measured. If that would be helpful. Yeah, but <laughs> in, in in general terms, uh, emissions from the industrial sector, along with the built environment are probably the best understood okay. sectors of the, the wider inventory. Uh, many of those emissions can be measured directly. So uh, kind of, if you think of an example of a large industrial complex where there's you know, specific big chimneys, you can actually measure the, the emissions coming from those chimneys, and that has to be reported for compliance with the EU emissions trading scheme at the moment. So those emissions are known really quite well, and in general, uh, with a very few exceptions, they tend not to be revised due to scientific improvements. Um, in contrast to that, I appreciate this is uh, out with the immediate scope of the question, but really kind of the contrast to that is more the land use mm -hmm. sectors where you're relying upon bottom-up modelling of complex biological processes. You can't measure the emissions. You can't measure the emissions directly. Um, like I said, I'm very happy to write back with a really detailed Explanation. On two sides of A4, do you think? I'll do my best. <laughs> Thank you. OK, uh, moving on. Mark Roscoe. You've outlined some of the challenges in, in using annual targets um, <coughs> as opposed to multi-year budgeting. W will you be sticking with annual targets? Yes. We're not intending to move away from that. I mean, it's, it's, it's challenging. Um, uh, um, I think we're the only country that do it. Uh, um, but uh, nevertheless, um, we've become accustomed to it, um, and I think it's probably uh, that the, I see no reason to move away from it. And I consistently make the point internationally <laughs> that we are the only country doing annual targets. So, um, so it's uh, it's it's an important aspect of how we manage what we do. Um, I, I guess the whole discussion, though, is just that we shouldn't allow annual targets to 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 become the, the only thing that we talk about here. Um, because annual targets can be swayed by, well, we, you know, we've just been through um, a winter that went on a lot longer than anybody was anticipating. One can uh, expect that that will have uh, implications um, uh, for, what are we in, 2018 for the 2020 figures? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, folk will have to look back and remember that, you know, winter went on into the first week of April. Um, therefore, everybody's heating was on, everybody's, you know, and all that kind of thing. So, um, so annual targets are subject to that kind of impact. But I think, nevertheless, um, from our perspective, I think the, the experience of it has been in the main um, positive and helpful. 
So we're not moving away from them. Okay. Okay. Uh, does anybody have any other questions? Okay. Uh, in, light, in light of that, Cabinet Secretary, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I think it goes without saying that this is a, a subject we will be returning to in Indeed. considerable detail in the uh, remainder of the year. So uh, thank you and your officials for your time this morning. Okay. At its next meeting on the 15th of May, the committee will meet in private to discuss a draft of its report on the Scottish Crown Estate Bill at Stage 1. As agreed earlier, the committee will now move into private session and I request that the public gallery be cleared as the public part of the meeting is now closed. <laughs>